to hear what, what the sign is, can you? Listen carefully. Friends, there is no question that this world of ours is in catastrophic turmoil everywhere, right? I've just come back from Jamaica, as you know, where burial, the earliest and most devastating hurricane, hit the Caribbean in June, the first, the earliest ever. It destroyed Barbados, it devastated Grenada, and like a roaring lion, it swept all across the Caribbean and the Yucatan Peninsula and into Texas and went all the way up the East Coast even, wreaking death and destruction all along the way. In Jamaica, it wiped out the breadbasket parishes, St. Elizabeth and Manchester, where all the food is grown, all because of the latest eruption of climate change. I read yesterday how the scientists are saying that June and July produce the hottest days on record. So that DC last week had temperatures of 104. Reno, Nevada, 105. Fresco, California reached 112. Phoenix, Arizona, 116. And listen to this. Death Valley, California reached 129 degrees, one degree shy of the hottest temperature on the planet ever. Fires and floods in Europe, in Asia, and North America have reached world records with unbelievable consequences of suffering for human beings, or brothers and sisters, all over the world. I don't know if you heard the story about what's happening in Vietnam and Taiwan this very past week. And I haven't yet mentioned the atrocities in Gaza and Ukraine. Do I need to mention those? And a friend while I was in Jamaica said, what else is possible? We are surely coming to the end of the world. And you know what I said to him? I said, People said the same thing when the Apostle Peter was preaching in the first century. In fact, the reason he wrote that letter that we have just read a moment ago, the reason he wrote to those young converts in Asia Minor was to encourage them because they were scared to death and on the run from their life for their lives from the Hamas and Putin of their day, the Roman Emperor Nero. So Peter, in fatherly fashion, wrote to them and said, what I hope you hear loud and clear this morning. Beloved, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal, notice the word, fiery ordeal that is testing you as though something strange were happening to you. And then he concluded, he said, don't forget that your adversary, the devil, like a roaring lion, is prowling around seeking someone to devour. Someone so sorry for themselves that they are crying all the time, no one else in the world has troubles like I have. Someone so sad of heart and sick in mind and spirit that they just are spreading gloom and doom all around the world, wherever they are, like Job of old, who said in chapter 14 and verse 1, man born of woman, has but a few days, and they are full of trouble. 
Read that again. Chapter 14, verse 1. Someone who believes you can ever make it in this world on your own and by yourself, but is wise enough to realize what Peter's advice is, that it is perfect. When he said to them then and to us now, cast all, notice he didn't say some, cast all your cares and anxieties and your burdens on the whom? Not the politicians, right? <laughs> Cast all your cares on the Lord, for he cares for you. And the literal translation, as I checked the Greek, was, it matters greatly to God concerning you. So cast all your cares on him. Yes, your pain and your suffering. And realize that all of that is a sign that something has gone terribly wrong in your body. That's why you're sick and in the hospital. Something terribly wrong has gone amiss in our minds and in our world all around us and that is why there is so much catastrophe and chaos and pain and suffering and and, and 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 nature itself seems to be in total turmoil and when you realize that and uh, and you're at your wits end and you cry out with the psalmist of old and say my god my god why have you forsaken me and why are you so far from hearing me and the cries that i'm uttering just remember what peter said to them in the first century those who are so scared to death of nero and those of us who are at our wit's end today, call upon the Lord and come to know without the shadow of a doubt that our God is able. Our God has the ability and the deep desire to make all the difference in our lives. So cast all your cares upon him. Cast all your burdens on him. All your worries and your anxieties on him. His knees are not going to buckle when you throw the burdens and anxieties upon him. His back is made broad enough to carry your burdens. Because that is the metaphor that is being used in that passage. It's, it's from a, a donkey and the saddle that you put on the donkey. And, and Peter is saying, just like you put the saddle on the donkey because its back can handle it, cast all your cares on the Lord. His back can handle it. Do you know what I'm talking about this morning? Cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. He can handle it. His knees won't buckle under the burden of your cares and your anxieties. And the psalmist knew that so well. And that is why he confidently gave testimony in his own day. He said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the what? The shadow of death. I will fear no evil. Why? Because thou art with me. Oh, I, I, I'm, I'm feeling good this morning. I hope you're feeling good too. <laughs> yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Do you know what I'm talking about? Is that your testimony this morning? My friends, I'm saying in the face of pain and suffering in your life and in all the world around us, don't you want to hear the reassuring fatherly words of advice that Peter gave to his young Christian followers in his day when he said to them, after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace and comfort will himself personally restore you, make you strong, solid as a rock, unbending when the storms of life pounce upon you. Oh, does that make a difference when you hear that? 
That is the promise. That is what the apostle testified and said from his own experience. He said, I know that after you have been through all of this for a little while, the God of all comfort will come and give you the strength and the ability. So just remember to lean upon the Lord. That's why I love that song so much that the choir led us in at the leaning on the everlasting arms. You have no fear, no doubt, no, you, no anxiety, no worry when you cast all your cares upon the Lord. Is that what you do at Lely? The saintly Louisa Stead, her husband and their very young daughter, were enjoying an oceanside picnic one day when a drowning boy they saw in the sea cried out for help, 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 I'm drowning. And Mr. Stead jumped into the sea to save this little boy who tragically was drawn under by the swift undercurrent and was drowned right in front of their very eyes. He and the boy, because the little boy, terrified, just pulled him under. He tried his best, but couldn't save him. During the dreadful, heart-rending, and sorrowful days that followed this tragedy, Louisa Stead cast all her cares upon the Lord of her life, and the immortal words of that song that the choir sang this morning came to her. And that song has touched many a life. You all know it so well. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take him at his word. Just to lean. There is the word again. Just to lean upon his promises. Just to know, thus says the Lord. I will never leave you or forsake. And shortly after that tragic experience where the little boy and her husband were drowned together on that seashore, Louisa Stead not only wrote that song, but heard and answered the call to the mission field. And she went to South Africa and was a missionary there for 25 years. Now listen to me as I end. She could have been so terrified and so angry at God, at her loss. And she could have said that this is a sign of God's punishment for sin, like Job's immature friend were saying to him in his own day when he was crying out and complaining, why is everything taken away from me and his friends, those immature folks? Instead of shutting their mouth and just sitting by him and holding his hand, they said, why don't you just confess that you have sinned and done something and that is why you're suffering. Louisa Stead could have resorted to that kind of a apology and anger. Or worse, she could have said, this is a sign of God's abandonment and lack of interest in justice and mercy for one like me, so faithful and kind and giving and, li and living generously. Or even worse, she could have said, it is a sign of God's unwillingness and inability to do anything about trouble and suffering and pain and sorrow and sickness in this world. God is not able. God is not caring or compassionate. Or, on the other hand, she could have maturely have seen pain and suffering that so many of us have to deal with every day as a sign that this world of ours is infected with evil at its very core. You heard what I'm saying. There is something that is amiss in our world 
There is a demonic power that is wreaking havoc in all the world, in all of creation, and that is what is causing all the chaos and catastrophe and pain and suffering that we wonder about and we can't really handle by ourselves or on our own. Do you know what I'm talking about this morning? Listen to me now. I'm ending. Paul was acknowledging that fact in, in the most beautiful theological expression of his whole life in Romans chapter 8. You need to read that passage when you get home. When he wrote in those celebrated words of theological profundity and insight about the world, he said, we know that the whole creation has been growing in groaning rather in labor pains until now in other words what we are engaging and what we are feeling and so worried about is a sign that we are caught up in the birth pangs of the new creation that God is about to bring about the new world that God is bringing into being no wonder it is so painful because what we are involved in is birth pains of the new creation. So Peter encourages us to say by saying, Beloved, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal as though something strange is happening. What you're dealing with is labor pain like my mother felt when I was born and weighed 11 pounds. I don't need to say anything, right? Don't be surprised. You're dealing with labor pains. It is always tough. But just remember, after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all comfort and grace will himself restore you and your calm, will support you and strengthen the foundations of your faith so he will bring you healing and hope like never before. So hold to God's unchanging hand. That's what I'm talking about this morning. Ask Thomas Dorsey if that is not the case. You know Thomas Darcy, don't you? He's the father of modern gospel. He will confirm from his own personal experience that that is absolutely true. The story is that he was in St. Louis, Missouri, at an evangelistic meeting, and he got a telegram that his wife and little child that they were expecting died in childbirth together. Oh, and he cried out and said, Lord, where are you? I don't know. I am all the way out here in St. Louis, and, and you do this to me? The pain and suffering broke his heart, but it inspired him to write the beautiful classic, Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on. Help me stand. I am weak. I'm worried. I'm worn. But through the night, lead me to the light. Precious Lord, take my hand. That's how that song got written. Let us stand and sing it now as the choir leads us in that wonderful affirmation of faith as a prayer. Precious Lord, take my hand. Because suffering 